But the Shaw Festival really seems to have hmm? seems to the Shaw Festival seems to have a more sure-footed artistic integrity over the years, whereas Stratford has a bit of weaved and wallowed in terms of the integrity and and the integrity well, of the central art of it. Leadership, the vision of the leader. You know, it's very difficult. Uh, the one thing about Christopher Newton that I noticed working with him for all these years was the fact that he built a family. That's the difference. And his, his theater company was his family. His actors were his children, you know. We always used to say that the relationship between Christopher and I, his head of design and his, and his artistic director, was like a marriage. You know, there were com compromises had to be made. In this, in this, in this union, this vision, but he built a family. Remove the family, and it just becomes dysfunctional to some degree. Yeah. And I think there, that was one of the biggest uh, um, uh, benefits of working at Shaw was that when you became part of the family, you know, people loved it there, just loved it. Mm -hmm. And it shows up. It shows. And it shows up on stage. It shows yeah. up on stage. It shows up in the brochure. It shows up in the Absolutely. seasons. It shows up yeah. in a kind of yeah. continuity uh, uh, yeah. of it. That, uh, but that, that, that was Christopher's strength, total strength, was building a family. So you work with some directors like Christopher Newton, who you work with for, for so long, and you have a shorthand between you? Oh, yeah. That's How does right. that work? <laughs> well, it, 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 it's, I guess it started right from day one when he came into my office in Vancouver and sat down in front of me and said, I'm Christopher Newton and I've just been hired as the artistic director that we met here. And I said, yes, I, I know who you are and it's nice to meet you, sir, and all that sort of stuff. And um, he says, I've seen your work. He says, I've seen a lot of your work. He says, I come to Vancouver quite often to look at the work. Oh, that's good. I said, you know. And then he said, um, I want to actually start the season off with something that people just are not going to forget. I want to show my colors, in other words. I want to show what I'm about and what this theater company is going to be about. All right, fine. You know, I've heard that before. And then he said to me, have you seen Fellini's Satyricon? Now, the thing was, I just had. It was playing in Vancouver. And I said, yes, yes, I have. And he said, what did you think of it? I said, this is the most extraordinary film I've ever seen in my life. I said, just amazing. I said, just wonderful. He said, good. I'm doing Julius Caesar, and we're going to be just fine. And that's how it started, you know, just like that. And that's how the short thing would start, you know. Saying something that would trigger something in your, in your mind, imagination, or whatever it is, right. that got you going on a certain path. And it may just be a color. Right. I think Christopher always says, sometimes Cameron says, I, I see it as red, but it ends up being green on the stage, you know. <laughs> but he says, I know exactly what he means by it. Because it's maybe not the color, it's the feeling uh, that the color will give, or whatever the case may be. So that's with how the shorthand started. But so I would just walk past his office, say four or five words, he'd say four words, and the production would arrive on stage. Well, know? like a marriage. And the couple, like, like, uh, the couple knows each other. Yeah, so. he, yeah. You know, you know the strengths and the weaknesses and all that sort of stuff. And yeah. did you ever have any set twos with him? I mean, no. fundamental disagreements? No. I mean, pet peeves sometimes. Yeah. But, What's a pet peeve? Hmm? A pet peeve. Give me an example. Well, it goes back a long way. But there was. <laughs> we used to have awards in Vancouver. You know, like the Academy Awards and what have you, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And these were called the Silver Ball Awards, and it was for the staff. It was for the family and all their spouses and girlfriends, whatever the case may be. And they'd hand out these awards: the best new Canadian play by Jenny Phipps because she rewrote it every night on stage, you know, <laughs> those kind of awards. Well, anyway, I always got the Eternal Optimist Award. And if you won it four years in a row, it became a memorial award. <laughs> and Christopher always got the Eternal, um, 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 what was it now, it's the Procrastination Award. And it became the Christopher Newton Memorial Procrastination Award. Because he would make, he never made the decision until it was almost too late. Right. And his reason for that was he always wanted to be open to change of what was happening around him, 
at the time. He never made decisions. It was very difficult for him to make a decision a year in advance on something. Like he had to, he had to learn to do that at the Shaw Festival, was to create a season six months in advance. The world could change in six months, right. and he wouldn't be able to change the season, you see. So some of those times when I was had my back uh, up against a wall on deadlines, you know, and I couldn't get the information I wanted because he was waiting for the right moment to tell me. He just learned to live with it. And to go on and the he's right. He is right because his yeah. decisions were timely decisions, always right for the time. So the two parts of the decision, what the decision actually is and the timing that the decision is made. Yeah. Those are the two elements of yeah, the decision absolutely. making, it seems to me. The timing for him is important that, uh, you know, at a, at a certain point in time, you know, like when we did the St. Joan, when Neil Monroe and I did the St. Joan, was just after the key weight problems, etc., the burning of the oil fields and all of that. And Neil and I decided that that production had to have elements in it of now, right now. But the only place that that could happen was in the Inquisition, because Neil wanted to do a media scrum. He wanted it to look like a televised trial. So how do we do that in, in a play that was basically designed for a medieval look? So what we did is we time traveled. Each, each section was a different time. It started with a First World War in France kind of feel to it. Then the next one was a Second World War. And then the third one was this, this great British jet on stage, just the wing and the engine and two people sitting under the wing having tea over a hamper. And that, at that, at the, at that Couchon and, and right. Warwick scene, when they're dividing up Joan's empire, to the end being the media scrum, um, where we brought, had walls of television sets. Right. And, uh, and, you know, and Mary Haney had to sit with her back to the audience, and this is tough for an actor, acted with her, never faced the audience. But we had a television camera on stage coming this way at her. And her face and her reaction was on the screen. And that's what Neil wanted to kind of create, which was a now thing, was we don't get involved, involved at all with, 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 the, with the human being. We get more involved with the picture on the television screen. And that's what he was trying to communicate. Oh, it was wonderful. It Let's jog back a little bit, because we talked about you and Christopher and, and mm -hmm. you know, Shorthand relationships. There you are meeting a director for the first time you have never worked with yeah. before. How do you start to form a relationship with a new director? We ch I, I usually try to find the things that we have in common, right off the bat. A lot of it has to do with food, cooking, and things like that. You know, et cetera, et cetera. Usually. You know, it's, it's interesting that because you, I don't start with the play. I mean, you just find out the things they had in common. That, uh, what they've done, you may have seen a production that they did. You talk about that for a while. Or they've seen a production you've done, talk about that. And then you, get, you come to the play. You know, and there's, there's a whole series of courtships, I always call them. You know, this marriage between the designer and the director. There's a courtship process that takes place where you, you get into the play by finding the moments that you both see together. And again, it has to do with those realities that, are, that you see in your vision and the realities that he or she sees in, her, in his vision that are the same. You find those touchstones where you're talking the same language. And then you can proceed from there. I usually, a lot, I know a lot of designers come with nothing to, to meeting a director for the first time. And we'll say things like, you know, what do you want to do with this piece? I, I don't say that. I don't do that. I find out what we are going to do with this piece. Right. You know, because it is a collaboration between the designer and the director to start with. So it's we. What are we going to do with this piece? Not what are you going to do with it? Or what am I going to do with it? It's what we do it. And I bring things. I will bring things. Sometimes pictures. Usually in the second meeting, I will come armed with 
books and paintings and pictures and music and all sorts of things that, that relate to what we've been touching on, the touchstones that we're talking about. Looking at, when I met, when Derek and I were doing uh, um, the uh, Cyrano de Bergerac, he knew the Shakespeare sh structure that I was designing for him at the time and sketching. But the next meeting we had when I was bringing him costume concepts and concepts for each scene was, he was playing Balios. Because that was what he wanted, you know what I'm getting at? So we had this meeting with Balios going along. And I remember Christopher saying, because Christopher is acting in it, he said to me, he said, the one thing that Derek has done for me in this, he says, He's introduced me to Balios, a composer that I never, I had taken for granted. Right, right. And, and then that's how it started. By listening to Balios, I understood the French more. I understood exactly where Derek's soul was in this piece. And the loudness of Balios. He used to crank it up so loud the paint would come off the wall. Right. You know, he, he loved loudness. I always suspected he had a hearing problem, but I wasn't sure. And you've been interested in all the European influences, rather than, say, the Japanese influences or whatever. No, not, not necessarily. I mean, what Kurosawa did in the film with the, with the, with the Scottish play, right. with Throne of Blood, I was deeply, deeply affected by that and influenced by that. Um, but, and then, but the answer is, my culture is a little closer to the Europeans than it is to the Asians. Right. I, I respect it. I love the design. I love everything about it. But when it comes to the language, it, 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 I'm closer to the Europeans. I always say that as a kid from Saskatchewan, I know Chekhov. <laughs> <laughs> I know Chekhov, you know. It's good, yeah. It's perfect out there. Yeah. Chekhov during the dirty 30s. Oh, hey, Saskatchewan. Have you ever directed? Have I ever directed? No. Have you wanted to? No. What do you think of people like Peter Greenaway who directs? Yes. Um, in many cases, y you have to be a certain inspired genius, like Peter Greenaway, or Ridley Scott, another artist. Oh, I Ridley know. Scott was a painter who, who, who went into direction. Do you know the Gladiator? Wonderful little story on Gladiator. They offered grad Gladiator to Ridley Scott, and he said, no, I don't want it. They showed him a painting by a French artist called The Gladiator. He took one look at the painting and said, I'll do it. Wow. It was the painting that got him to do it, not the money. <laughs> oh, they're probably money. It's but one, story, one looks at Peter Greenaway, one, one yeah. looks at the strength of your design, the, the worlds that you like to create in the design, the feeling, the texture, the mm -hmm, black box, mm -hmm. the first moment that grows out, and you go, well, are you never frustrated, Cameron, that you, you have such a strong visual working of the story that you would just say, well, I would actually like to direct this. Well, um, one, one film producer in Toronto here uh, said at one point, when somebody asked the question on set, you know, to me about, would you ever think of wanting to direct a film? And this producer, the director producer, turned around and says, he's directed every <laughs> one of my films. <laughs> You know, there's a way of directing, and there's a way of directing. I mean, and his know. last name starts with a D. And his last name starts with a D. No, he did say that, and I said that's why I don't don't need to direct the films because here's the here's the point. Let's be a little more specific about this. You take that black box I looked at, and I put an actor in that black box. That first reality on the stage, the, the performer, the actor, the character, and I put a staircase in, and a door. I've directed the scene. Yes, in a way. In yeah. a way, I've directed the yeah. scene. Yeah. The actor is going to come through that door. Yeah. He's going to go up that staircase and down. He can't go anywhere else. I've, and the I've blocked it, in other words.